but I want to give a, just a very brief introduction um, and let you know who we are and also thank our partners at the Maryland Department of Health, Behavioral Health Administration, particularly Frank Dyson, who has helped us uh, pull this together um, and make sure we have hopefully a lot of the important people across the state in the room to hear this overview. But my name is Kelly Coble. I'm the program director for Max, the Maryland Addiction Consultation Service. And we're really grateful to partner with Mr. Dyson in uh, bringing Dr. Olson here today to give this overview. So I'll, I'll briefly introduce you, Dr. Olson, uh, and hope I don't leave out anything too important, but there is an awful lot um, to say. I think you might have a lot of familiar faces here today. We're grateful to have you in Maryland since you are a Marylander. Um, maybe you'll have the flag on your slides or something to give a little shout out <laughs> to your home state. Uh, but Dr. Ingvild Olson serves as the director for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. She has a long history of working within the addiction treatment field to expand access to care and enhance quality. She began her career as the medical director for the Johns Hopkins Hospital Outpatient Substance Use Treatment Services, while a full-time assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She subsequently served as the Deputy Health Officer for Maryland's Hartford County Health Department, where she led a modernization of publicly funded substance use treatment services in collaboration with state and local partners. She next served as the Vice President of Clinical Affairs for the Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems, then the Local Addiction Authority for Baltimore City. In that position, she played a central role in the expansion of buprenorphine treatment for opioid addiction in both specialty treatment and general ambulatory medical systems. Dr. Olson has also served as medical consultant to the Maryland Behavioral Health Administration, as a clinical expert to the Maryland Addiction Consultation Service at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and as an advisor on addiction interventions to the Baltimore City Health Department. From 2011 to 2021, she served as the medical director for IBR Reach Health Services, a comprehensive outpatient substance use disorder treatment program in Baltimore City, and has held numerous senior volunteer leadership positions in the field of addiction medicine. I'll pause there because um, I would be reading a long, <laughs> illustrious list of positions. Um, we're really grateful to have you here, Dr. Olson. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, folks, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat and answer um, questions there. We can um, uh, hand them over to Dr. Olson at the end. Great, thank you so much, um, Kelly, and hopefully everyone can hear me. Great. Um, and it is, it is such a pleasure to um, see some uh, familiar faces, some new faces, which is really exciting. Um, and also just, I am uh, very excited to be here with you all to kind of talk through some of the 42 CFR Part 8 uh, changes that um, were released that SAMHSA published earlier this year. Um, hopefully, many of you have seen many of these, and uh, we can... Um, engage in a discussion uh, around how things are going. Uh, I have been really traveling across the country. I was in Utah a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been to Nevada and um, New York and uh, um, Tennessee and um, and just, you know, all around kind of the country. I think that there's a lot of excitement um, around many of these changes and yet also kind of lots of questions still around how are these getting implemented and how are these also, um, how are you all as OTP administrators and um, physicians and cl other clinicians, how are you thinking about them um, and, uh, and also talking with your staff and uh, patients about them as well. So with that, I am gonna share my screen here. Let's see if it's this. All right, can you all see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. And are you seeing there you we seeing, go. Okay. You seeing the slides or the slide notes? We can see the slides. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm gonna just um kind of go through this uh um really in um the uh I have no disclosures. Um I will say that uh the federal government has let me that they let me out. Uh, about four hours almost every every Friday morning to actually continue to see some of the patients that um, I've had 10 years plus relationships with at IBR Reach. So I do that as a just a physician 
um, you know, in my uh, capacity as a, an addiction medicine specialist physician. Um, but I did want to note that. Uh, I would um, just kind of highlight that I want to just start a little bit by talking about some of the rationale for why we made these changes. And hopefully at the end of this, really to kind of lead you leave you all with um, an ability to think about how to apply at least three of these changes to um, your OTP and um, uh, and then three of the benefits, um, because uh, we think that there's a lot of benefits here um, uh, for patients and OTPs. So, you know, one of the things I think kind of that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about and that uh, kind of keeps me up at night sometimes is, you know, the fact that we're still losing um, over 100 thousand lives per year, despite the recent decreases that we've seen, which we're very op cautiously optimistic about. Um, you know, I think uh, I remember when fentanyl really hit Maryland and hit Baltimore City kind of in the uh, around 2015 um, and uh, just the dramatic change between, you know, the prescription opioids and then heroin. Heroin had always been an issue for um, for Baltimore. Um, but just the dramatic change that happened when uh, illicitly manufactured fentanyl kind of came on the scene. And um, it was pretty dramatic in terms of, you know, people coming into care and saying um, this was the first time that they really had tried to access methadone. And they were just terrified because there were people dropping, <clears throat> you know, friends and family members um, uh, that were losing their lives and they didn't want to uh, to have that happen to them. Um but since then, we know that the substance use landscape really has just evolved dramatically and is much more dynamic than ever. And so making sure that we can um, provide access to, um, to individuals, given kind of this evolving landscape and given just how dangerous um, it has become, um, is, uh, is really a huge driver be uh, behind many of the changes. Um, and we also know that we have lots of decades and decades and years of um, published evidence for the effectiveness um, and life-saving um, uh, efficacy of methadone and buprenorphine in particular, <clears throat> not only in um, reducing opiate overdose-related uh, mortality by over 50%, but really reducing infectious diseases and increasing employment, um, reducing criminality. And I will say that Many of the studies that actually um, are uh, cited and highlighted in TIP 63, but also in the National Academies report in 2019, were done in Maryland. Um, and uh, Maryland has had a very strong history of methadone access. And so I just really want to highlight that um, uh, in many ways, Maryland, I think, has been at the forefront um, of uh, a really advancing treatment um, for opiate use disorder with methadone. Um, and we all know that treatment with effective medications is not addiction by another means. Um, I think the stigma that really has surrounded um, uh, opiate treatment programs and um, opioid uh, use disorder treatment with medications, particularly with methadone, is one that um, uh, has been a huge challenge for all of us. Um, over many decades. And that is, you know, we, that's been exemplified by not in my backyard zoning laws over the years, <clears throat> you know, family um, patients coming in and kind of saying, oh, I can't stay on this medication because my family and friends um, that think that I'm not in recovery um, or that I'm just trading one addiction for another. But I will say that part, I think, of the stigma uh, related to methadone is one that we actually, as, and I count myself in this, that we actually, as, an, uh, as a field, um, as an OTP kind of industry, we haven't made it necessarily all that uh, easier for people. And we've contributed to that stigma. Um, I'm not gonna read these to you, but, um, uh, but I think over the years that we know that, um, you know, people sometimes have been uh, um, discharged from OTPs because of something that, Maybe they looked at someone the wrong way, or you know they um, uh, they uh, were upset um, and acted out in a certain way, kind of against nurses or counselors or um, or others. Uh, when that um, that acting out wasn't actually uh, you know in any way um, uh, reflective of um, uh, you know 
uh, bodily harm or physical threats or anything like that. So, um, so I will say that, you know, just kind of, I think owning the peace that we have um, and that we have contributed to over decades um, is something that uh, that I think is also really um, part and parcel of what we're trying to now shift in terms of kind of a culture change and um, a uh, um, a change in really how um, OTPs are uh, are being perceived and behave. I think kind of these are our patients. Um, and so that's why I'm really excited because I think that these uh, revisions now provide an opportunity for a new approach, really putting the person at the center and providing supportive treatment environments that promote trust, recovery, and patient engagement. Because, you know, I'm probably speaking to the choir, but, you know, for me, working in an OTP and really being able to see just the growth and um uh, and recovery and uh, in, um, that the patients were able to achieve working in a multidisciplinary team that really all had, you know, kind of the same goal of helping patients um, and helping patients kind of move uh, forward with their um, treatment goals and the goals that they had for themselves. That has been one of the most rewarding experiences and one of the most rewarding pieces of my career. And, um, and so really being able to, uh, have OTPs be the um, great places to work and great great places to um, receive care, I think is uh, is something that this um, these revisions really provide the the framework for. And what that means is responsive and flexible OTP services that are grounded in evidence, as I showed you that you know the opiate overdose epidemic is changing, um, and we have to change along with that. Um, you know the uh, the the lethality and um, the risks of significant bodily harm that um, is now uh, that people now face with xylazine and fentanyl and um, nitazines and um, metatomidine and kind of you name it, that is very different than it was even five, 10 years ago. Um, and so our approaches, our approaches have to change with that. Um, and that also means that acknowledging the skill and that patient-centered understanding of treating practitioners and that um, multidisciplinary team, you know, people in OTPs, staff in OTPs, you, we all get to know our patients. You all get to know your patients. And, um, and so part of kind of our role as, um, as SAMHSA is <clears throat> to really be able to um, have and acknowledge the skill and, um, and that, uh, that knowledge that you all gain um, with working your, your patients. And so kind of tr creating them those plans of care that are person-centered, safe, and effective, and based off of that clinical judgment um, and shared decision-making is uh, is really kind of the, um, the goal here. And then finally, I think that, you know, this other opportunity um, here is now to promote medications for obese disorder as a treatment for a chronic medical condition. You know, I, I've kind of said, um, as I've been going around that, I mean, essentially, in my mind, there are two parts of our specialty behavioral health system that really are aligned with the scientific understanding of opiate use disorders, substance use disorders as chronic medical conditions. And one of those is OTPs, and the other one are CCBHCs, or those certified behavioral health um, centers. Um, because we have uh, OTPs are designed for long-term care um, and for really being able to help support patients kind of through those various different parts of their treatment process, their recovery process, whatever that looks like for that individual. Um, and that we're kind of there to, um, to meet and be alongside with them and support them um, uh, in that, uh, that process. And so, um, what that also means is really working together to overcome the stigma um, that has been, uh, unfortunately, such a big part of, uh, you know, much of this treatment um, methodology that through application of evidence-based practices and skills. So what are then, is, um, diving just a little bit more into kind of the changes themselves. So how do, you know, these new opportunities uh, grounded in kind of this uh, evolving landscape. Um, so what, is, what does it really mean? What does it really look like? 
So I'm going to go through kind of these very different sections. Um, and, and then at the end of uh, of this, hopefully we'll have some time for, um, for questions and um, and um, and discussion. But the first is that, you know, when we really looked at the admission criteria and part of this, actually, some of this actually came out of Congress as well, that um, given just the lethality of the current landscape, really wanting to make sure that people could get access to uh, to methadone treatment in ways that perhaps had been a barrier before. So making sure that we're focusing on the DSM-5 diagnosis, um, but also making uh, understanding that people can have been in remission. They can have had a mild opiate use disorder that were in remission, and now they're really terrified of a recurrence or a relapse because something has happened in their life. Um, and that... Um, uh, that risk, um, given just the lethality of the drug supply now, that that is um, uh, an appropriate reason for them to actually be able to um, seek services in an OTP. Um, same thing kind of with the risk of over and overdose. Um, all of those emission decisions, um, obviously, I think kind of with everything along here, um, has to be documented along with that consent to treatment. Because if there are people who you know, they don't necessarily have the physiological kind of piece so that tolerance or withdrawal, um, they're using fentanyl twice a week or once a week, right? And they don't have withdrawal from it, that um, starting them on a medication like methadone or buprenorphine that um, uh, have associated um, physical dependence, that people just need to understand that um, and be informed about that. Um, I think the other piece that uh, we wanted to highlight is the definition of a practitioner has been expanded. So it includes nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, in a way that now states um, and OTPs do no longer need to um, submit any of those uh, exceptions to, um, to be able to have um, NPs and PAs really do the work of medication management and admitting um, individuals uh, and um, providing take-home uh, dose decisions, et cetera, um, given that nurse practitioners and PAs in many states, like in Maryland, particularly on the nurse practitioner end, are independently practicing um, uh, uh, clinicians. And so, um, so we wanted to, uh, to really make sure that we're um, expanding and kind of being in, in line with um, the current uh, understanding of kind of those um, specialties um, or uh, um, disciplines. Um, the medical director role still must be filled by an MD or DO, and that person is really responsible for all the medical and behavioral health services that are provided and administered by the OTP, and that really hasn't changed. Um, the other piece I wanted to just highlight is the um, the uh, and this is one of the really big changes. Um, again, understanding that you know we really wanted to um, improve access and remove barriers to uh, to treatment. So, um, if you think about kind of in the past, that uh, all of the um, the full biopsychosocial assessment, the physical exam, kind of all these pieces that very often uh, patients have come in and they're not feeling well or you know, they're starting to not feel well. And if they're sitting through a two to three hour long um, uh, assessment, that by the end of that, they may just be so, you know, not focused on really providing the information that we want it, that is necessary and that is helpful for the treatment team and the treatment plan, that making sure that actually kind of we can get people started on the medication and then kind of, you know, work with them to gather all the other um, information that uh, um, that is really helpful to understand kind of that whole person um, uh, care and making sure that we're really uh, paying attention to all the various different pieces um, uh, that um, and all the various different health issues that they may be walking in the door with because very, I think all of us can recognize that people often um, don't walk through the door just with their opiate use disorder. There are a whole host of other conditions um, and social drivers of health that that uh, that they're dealing with. And so that was the reason for really um, pulling out kind of and creating this two-part exam. So that initial screening that the goal is to establish that diagnosis of an opiate use disorder, establish the criteria for admission to the OTP, ruling out any contraindications to methadone or buprenorphine, and then really determining that initial dose and just that initial kind of uh, dose titration. 
Um, we did increase the initial max dose up to 50 milligrams, um, given the uh, realities of fentanyl, um, but also that practitioner discretion can be applied with um, in, in terms of that dose, uh, whether it is less than that or maybe needs to be a little bit more than that. But that's based on kind of the um, the clinical uh, judgment of the um, the uh, the admitting practitioner. Um, and then the full assessment then that includes the history, physical, lab tests, the psychosocial assessment and the treatment plan. Those are then other pieces that can then um, be gathered throughout the next 14 days. Um, the other big piece that we included was uh, telehealth. So um, under the COVID flexibilities um, and a lot of the data that um, support these changes as safe and effective really came from that natural experiment of COVID. You know, I think when when that happened um, and SAMHSA opened up these flexibilities, you know, the sky didn't fall. Um, the the data really shows that um, that expanding access to uh, methadone take home um, doses as well as the buprenorphine telehealth uh, provisions, those both um, uh, were uh, safe and effective and really help people stay in care and uh, um, and. Uh, uh, really being able to do that. So the telehealth that we had, we incorporated the, the one for buprenorphine, so that's through audio only or audio visual. Um, and then the one thing that SAMHSA had not done at, during the COVID was extend any telehealth uh, initiation provisions for methadone. Um, and in places in many states where they are have a lot, very rural areas, very frontier areas, that has been a big challenge. And so we wanted to make sure again that um, building off of the um, the uh, the evidence and um, and the experience during COVID uh, with telehealth and buprenorphine that doing an audio visual telehealth visit um, to initiate methadone um, also seemed uh, very appropriate. And so um, that was uh, then part of kind of what we also included. Um, so the next section um, speaks a little bit more also to kind of how, um, again, just the whole idea here is to reduce barriers to care. And so um, we know that <clears throat> Maryland has been one of those places where um, there have been individuals who now are getting started on methadone in the hospital um, and with then transitions out into the community and into the community OTPs. And so really being able to support that kind of model <clears throat> where people can, um, uh, and the OTP can appropriately use the exam that was done by not a non-OTP practitioner, um, reviewed, verified, and then integrated into the, um, the patient records, that that is also something that uh, is, um, again, reducing barriers to, uh, to access. And um, as well as really, um, helping to connect and, and make those coordination and collaboration channels um, <clears throat> and foster those between the OTPs and other parts of the healthcare system. Um, one of the biggest areas that we've been getting a lot of questions about is the, are the changes that we made to the counseling services. So we really ended up disaggregating um, counseling from the delivery of medication. And part of the reason for this is that if, if there are situations, and there have been situations in which patients are coming in um, and uh, there's a hold on them, they have to engage in a counseling session before they are able to get their medication. And in instances now, given fentanyl and all the other contaminants that are uh, complicating um, and, and increasing risk for patients, that if that patient then walks out the door, um, uh, because they have to choose between engaging in the counseling session and getting their kids off to school or making it to work on time. Um, because if they're not on time to work, they're going to lose their job. Like patients have um, varying different uh, um, uh, drivers for what then helps to engage them in services. But if they walk out the door without their medication for that, in particular for that day, then we really are setting them up for um, uh, for use of um, fentanyl and other substances 
um, in ways that may be very harmful. And so we really wanted to kind of disaggregate that um, the, the delivery of the medication from the delivery of the, the um, counseling services and other services. Um, part of that actually also um, comes from a study um, in, that was done in Maryland where uh, it um, it randomized people to kind of patient-directed counseling engagement versus usual standard of care. Um, and in fact, there was no, uh, the patient-directed arm really performed just as well as the, um, the usual care arm. And so really being able to actually, um, I think for us, that demonstrated that um, when you provide services and counseling services, non-medication services that are of value to people, they will engage in that because there's a reason they're walking through the door um, of that OTP. People want to feel better. They want to um, be able to uh, to make some change in their life uh, that is going to then really help them. So what that does not mean is that um, OTPs are off the hook for delivering services. Um, and I've had some people say to me, well, you know, if this is the case, then we might as well just like fire all our counselors. No, <laughs> that is not what it means. It, what it really means is that the onus now is on the OTP to um, to be creative and figure out how do we actually provide services that are of value to, to our patients? What what are they, um, uh, what uh, at an individual level, how can we actually kind of work with them in a shared decision-making approach to um, engage individuals in those services that um, uh, that they uh, that are going to be meaningful for them, and so um, that kind of individualized approach. This is very much about really operationalizing that, um, and we, uh, in order to be able to do that, also expanded kind of the definition of counseling as it relates to OTP services. Um, to include harm reduction education, recovery-oriented counseling, um, counseling on uh, HIV, viral hepatitis, and other STI prevention. Um, so that it's a, it's a much broader um, kind of frame um, because it may also be that, you know, a patient may um, really connect with their counselor, but maybe not. Maybe they'll connect with a peer recovery specialist or uh, a practitioner or, um, you know, nurses and and really all of that um, that counts. Um, we also really uh, wanted to um, have the uh, the OTB be kind of this, the place where there's a lot of integrated care opportunities because, again, people walk through our doors with um, high prevalences of um, hepatitis C and other um, comorbid conditions. So um, uh, being able to use the OTP as a place for being able to provide some of those services is something we um, wanted to highlight. Um, and then uh, while there are lots of things that the OTP can do, there are some things that probably are beyond the scope of the services that, uh, that they can provide. And so, um, but still really being able to take that whole person approach that being able to then have um, those connections with community services, vocational training, education, employment services, and we're really um, kind of looking at all of the, the four dimensions of recovery, um, uh, including health, home, purpose, and community. And so um, that's really where those come from. Um, we did not make any changes to the drug testing um, uh, pieces of um uh, of the rule, with the exception that I would just highlight, the rule does not um, specify the type of assay that needs to be done. And so um, that is something that uh, that I think people have um, have asked about uh, in terms of which types of assays uh, we require. Um, the, the rule is silent on that. Um, the other big change that we uh, that we made was the uh, adoption of the uh, many of the flexibilities for take home doses of methadone. Um, so what we ended up doing was um, really shortening the time and treatment requirement. That is the only criteria um, that uh, is kind of set in stone in the um, in the rule. Uh, and um, and for which if patients, uh, if the clinician or the practitioner um, it really wants to go outside of these um, timeframes, that's when an exceptional request would be needed. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, again, what COVID enabled us is to get 
evidence that um, having to wait two years or even a year for um, for patients to you know not have to come in more than twice a month or uh, you know once a month up to two years that was never evidence based. There was nothing kind of in the the data that re really demonstrated that that uh, was the time frame that was required. Um, the other criteria that I li list here, so uh, and the other criteria that are listed in the new rule are ones that practitioners need to consider. Um, so. Uh, you know, obviously kind of if there are safety concerns or risk of overdose, um, then that's part of that risk benefit calculus, right? Um, uh, and, um, but this is really not an adherence to rigid rules. Um, I think unfortunately the prior rules became kind of a red rigid, people had to meet every single one of them before they could get any take homes. Um, but this really is about uh, risk benefit analysis, um, the same way that we do a risk benefit analysis in any other area of medicine, um, that when it comes to uh, uh, particularly also control medications. Um, and this first one, which is that an absence of active substance use disorders, other physical or behavioral health conditions that increase the risk of patient harm as it relates to the potential for overdose or the ability to function safely, that needs to be taken kind of in its entirety. So it's not just the absence of active substance use disorders, it's actually the, the absence of active substance use disorders that would increase the risk of patient harm as it relates to the potential for overdose or ability to function safely. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that if folks have questions, but I did wanna um, highlight that that, uh, that is kind of a, a key and it's a consideration. Um, we also really wanted to highlight that that um, routine drug testing, again, should not be used punitively. It's part of, it's a data point at one point in time. Um, it really needs to be considered kind of uh, as part and in relation to the rest of the clinical uh, picture for an individual and, um, and help to promote kind of those person-centered discussion and treatment planning. Um, and then the other thing I think uh, I want to just highlight is that um, educating patients on safe storage and transport. You know, I think I can't, um, you know, the idea that methanol has to be, has to be stored in the refrigerator, like, no, <laughs> um, don't put it in the refrigerator. Uh, uh, there's no need for that. Um, but it also, the rule does not say that um, a lockbox has to be brought into the clinic um, because sometimes bringing in a lockbox actually puts a target on the patient's um, uh, and um, others, uh, other, and can actually kind of put the patient at risk for um, when they're leaving the um, the clinic as well. Um, and then, obviously, kind of there are state laws that uh, that also need to be considered um, here, as well as in in any part of the rule. Um, so, just a word about kind of special populations. So, you know, I, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone here that treating and admitting uh, pregnant patients with MIUD, that's a priority population. Um, we did uh, clarify the use of split dosing, um, particularly for uh, um, pregnant and postpartum individuals. Um, I want to highlight one thing, which is that when we talked about kind of the, sorry, the um, time and treatment um, criteria for take-home doses, it, it speaks to days, not doses. So uh, not doses, right? So if you are splitting um, a, a dose, then um, uh, that still is a day's worth of medication. And so it's not, uh, doesn't go by doses, it really goes by days. Um, the other thing, oh, sorry. I'm too fast. Um, the other piece that we clarified and, and uh, made some changes to is um, interim um, uh, maintenance or kind of interim uh, treatment. So that again is one place where this was really um, uh, um, studied in Maryland significantly many, many years ago. Um, and uh, again, found to be kind of a way of getting people into services and kind of get started on treatment especially when comprehensive services are not readily available. We did increase the um, 
the length of time for interim maintenance from 120 to 180 days, um, really making sure that kind of that transition period is a transition period and then people can get into um, comprehensive services prior to that 180 days being up so that people don't get dropped kind of on the 181st day. Um, uh, we've also um, identified really kind of considering the needs of youth and LGBTQI plus um, individuals, old, older adults, and any other local populations that uh, that really um, are determined kind of based on the, the geographic and, and epidemiological uh, um, nature of, uh, of a local population. Um, and uh, and then we've also uh, highlighted and, and clarified some of the services that are available in mobile units, um, that particularly to uh, to reach isolated or underserved populations. Um, and then just a word about documentation. I mean, I think that this is um, you know uh, this is kind of part and parcel of just medical care in general is you know documenting um, clearly in the patient record. Um, any exam findings, clinical rationale, kind of that shared decision making, patient progress. I think one of the things that we're really, again, kind of going to that in operationalizing individualized care, which is something we've all been talking about for many, many years, is that um, blanket, rigid, or standing order protocols or policies really don't align with individualized standards of care, and so uh, it should not be relied on. Um, but really, is it... Um, evidence-based uh, patient management, continuity of care, kind of that full person approach um, that really relies on individualized assessments and plans and documentation that can reflect that. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously retaining all records in, in compliance with other federal and state regulations. So that's a whirlwind, um, but I did want to kind of get through this so that we have some time for questions and, um, and discussion. But I wanted to just kind of end with, um, you know, what does this really mean for OTPs? And I think we see this as, uh, um, you know, a significant opportunity to uh, see more patients. In fact, when I was in Nevada, one of the things that, um, that several of the OTPs there said is that, um, that they've incorporated many of these changes. And, um, uh, and over the last year or so, they've seen that um, their admission rates have gone up by uh, almost 20%. Um, and so I do think that there is an opportunity really, um, you know, patients are kind of, uh, they are finding out about these changes. We we actually got a, uh, a notice from a, a physician in New York where essentially she had, uh, you know, um, messaged something around that a patient, a man in, uh, who had been using um, opioids for and had an opioid use disorder for about 20 to 30 years for the first time was coming in and asking for methadone um, and uh, and methadone related treatment. And when she asked him why it had taken him so long, he said, well, you know, I never could really figure this out um, in conjunction with my the rest of my life. But now I've heard that I don't have to come to the clinic every day. I can take medication home. And that really made the difference for me. And so this is real. We're really hearing kind of that the, the patients are excited about this. Um, and given some of the evidence that we have today, that it really helps to improve retention and care. Um, and given the, the lethal um, uh, drug supply that is out there, that's even more important than ever. Um, there's a way to expand the reach of uh, the OTP with mobile units, other services, as well as really help to foster innovation in evidence-based person-centered care. So being creative about how do we engage people now um, kind of in services in ways that maybe we weren't doing in the past. And an ability to really integrate primary care, infectious disease treatments, mental health services. Um, when I was in Utah a couple of weeks ago, um, I heard from several OTPs where they have really expanded kind of the service delivery and as, and as a result, the funding sources that they are um, are taking advantage of to really be able to provide all of those services. So whether that be primary care or uh, mental health treatment, uh, hepatitis C treatment, for example, um, and that that is part of kind of what um, they're looking at uh, to help um, diversify many of their funding sources and services. So um, 
I just wanted to uh, leave you also then with a, some more information um, and some resources. The, uh, the final rule is available in the Federal Register. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, there's a, it's very long, but the very, the beginning of it actually is a long preamble where you can find information um, for a lot of the background of the rule. The final rule itself is about 12 printed pages and um, is the, the last part of this very long document. Um, we are working and hope to publish the updated federal guidelines on OTPs um, soon. But in the meantime, there is a whole host of FAQs and some other information available on our web pages. And you can also reach out to this email um, with any non-clinical questions, um, particularly ones that don't uh, um, uh, require kind of very spe fact-specific legal analysis. Um, and then I did also want to just highlight that we have a new um, OTP technical assistance contract that we just kicked off a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, really with the, the goal of providing implementation assistance, we know that this is a lot of change um, and change is hard and, uh, and it doesn't happen just automatically. And so we really want to be able to provide um, all of the assistance that we possibly can um, as many ways that we can uh, in order to help um, kind of make this vision of, uh, of these new opportunities um, a reality. And so we will be getting more information out to the field in a couple of weeks um, with how to submit a request for additional technical assistance through this contract. But it covers everything from, you know, meeting with, um, with staff, providing training to staff, uh, um, looking at also how, if there are any accreditation or certification or um, or other uh, assistance needs um, uh, as well, um, conducting workshops, looking at kind of integrated care pieces, um, and then also really um, highlighting the, the um, importance of ensuring uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and OTPs. Um, so with that, I'm going to end there and say thank you and open it up to, to questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Olson. You have a number of questions already lined up in the chat. Would you like me to feed those to you or do you want to? Okay. Yeah, that'd be so, great. Let's see. Um, Heidi asked, um, we will start with the chat and then I see some hands too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Heidi indicated, we operate with the understanding that the maximum initial dose is 40 milligrams, 30 milligrams plus 10 milligrams after 30 minutes. Has that changed? Correct. That has changed. So that um, <clears throat> that maximum dose now is 50 milligrams. Um, and um, the with also, uh, there's a wording in the, um, the, the new rule that... Um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be 50 milligrams for everyone. I think that's part of the, uh, that for some people, it needs to be less than that, right? Um, for some people, it may actually need to be more than that. But that really is part and parcel of kind of that clinical judgment and understanding, you know, how much people are using, when they last used, um, what the severity of the withdrawal is. And so um, I think it's uh, it really is a um, an individualized um, decision as to what that starting dose is. Heidi, I'll wait and see if that answered your question. Feel free to um, jump in the chat again. And then I see a comment slash question. Oscar said, medical director role, still an MDDA role, DO role, which doesn't make sense. I can run my own Suboxone clinic in Maryland as an NP, but cannot be the medical director where I work. I don't know if there's more you want to comment on there, or if you want to come off mute, or just a comment for the group. And Bill, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, no. The um the rule still is that the um uh the, the medical director does need to be an MD or a DO. Okay, thanks, Ingvild. Um, and then John Beckman. This looks like just a comment. I got a lot of positive reactions at his pharmacy. His whole team has been through social acceptance training, and by dealing with our OUD patients as patients and not seen um, as their past failures. Lots of positive responses there. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. A question here from Nancy. Are ECGs being added to requirements secondary to increase in prolonged QTCs? So um, 
There is there are no requirements um, in the rule uh, related to ECGs, um, and um, uh, again, that's kind of a, a clinical judgment. I think that um, the contraindication kind of piece <clears throat> um, that I spoke about in terms of kind of the screening um, is uh, um, is primarily based on um, you know history. So if somebody obviously has a history of torsades or um, a family history of, you know, heart disease, then um, uh, or significant kind of arrhythmias that may um, uh, also then warrant some additional information. But um, I think the other piece about the risk uh, assessment, whether it be for take-homes or also admission, is the risk of not providing people with methadone. Um, there's, a, there's a risk there. Um, and so I think that um, is somebody who, uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the other part of the risk assessment that needs to be taken into account. Thanks, Dr. Olson. Um, a comment from Ken Stoller, hopefully updated COMAR uh, regulations will make this important point clear that everything other than time and treatment is to be used as considerations, not requirements to be met. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then Stephanie- That's at least from the federal side, yep. <laughs> Stephanie Weiss, regarding urine drug testing, this is a lengthy one. Um, are there any guidelines for OTP staff regarding what to do when patient report, report and test results are discordant? That's the overall message, such as consulting with a specialist, toxicology, MRO training, or at least performing confirmatory testing. Yeah, you know, so that's a great question. I think, um, uh, so... Um, there's so the rule, you know, as it uh, as it stands, um, doesn't get into kind of that level of detail. Um, so this may also be kind of a, a an area where there is additional. Um, uh, if you don't find kind of over the next several months that um, that the other information that's coming out from SAMHSA um, is sufficient, then this is one area where um, uh, it may. Uh, that OTPTA contract may come into handy, for example, or if there are, um, you know, some of the, we have the provider clinical support system, um, at MOUD through AAAP that also may be helpful. So, um, but I agree with you that sometimes clinicians' interp interpretation of drug testing results um, sometimes can uh, can be challenging depending on what what the results kind of look like. That, yeah, that's exactly the second part. This is a lengthy one, but if there's any chance there could be guidelines around this issue in the future, given how poor of a job we clinicians do at interpreting drug testing results. Um, I will make a max plug that you can always call here in Maryland. You can always call max for consultation and technical assistance and Marcial can drop that information in the chat. Um, Terrence Fitzgerald has a question. Does the DEA have opinions on regulations related to lock boxes or other changes like take homes? So um uh thank you Terry. The uh so the this rule um like every rule uh has to go through interdepartmental clearance and so um this was one that the DEA um uh signed off on um through interdepartmental clearance. So um you know uh what their opinions are um uh, you know I think you'd have to ask them um but their regulations um so there are they have rules, you know, that govern um, OTPs, but they're mostly really um, focused on medication storage, inventory, et cetera. So they, there's, um, theirs doesn't doesn't really kind of go into the, the thing like um, like take homes. Um, uh, but yeah, I would defer I would refer you to the DEA probably for their opinions. <laughs> and then a second question here from Terry Fitzgerald. These extra services like case management, care coordination, recovery support services, employment service, et cetera, they still need to be paid for by the program. Will SAMHSA actively advocate to be sure they're somehow reimbursed? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, uh, so a couple of things. One is that we um, we have had conversations and you know continue to have conversations with many of our federal partners in, um, in implementing all of this. So I think Maryland is lucky. Uh, relative to um, many other areas of the country, um, where uh, the um, the the rates are um, uh, uh, 
allow for kind of um, and uh, and support many of the um, particularly case, case management, kind of care coordination, um, the health home opportunity that exists in Maryland, I think is a really um, for OTPs is uh, is a significant benefit that doesn't exist in every state. Um, and every state's Medicaid program is different. And so um, that is one where SAMHSA really doesn't have a role um, kind of vis-a-vis -vis state Medicaid programs. Um, and then the, the Medicare bundle, um, and again, I can't really speak for CMS, but um, the Medicare bundle, um, uh, my understanding is, was recently uh, increased in terms of um, really being able to help support many of the services that uh, that we're talking about. So, um, uh, but yes, financing is certainly kind of um, one that, that has, comes up um, uh, everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Olson. Frank, I'm going to let you unmute. You've had your hand up for a while, and then there's a there's some more questions here in the chat. All righty. Um, good morning, Dr. Olson. I just want to take the opportunity to thank you for coming out and everyone that joined today. I do have a couple of questions. The first one is about interim maintenance and the change in language. Does this still apply to nonprofit-only OTPs? No, so that um, a great question. Uh, the the interim maintenance um, uh, flexibility um, is now also applicable to for profit OTPs. It's for profit and nonprofit OTPs. Okay, and the changes with the take home medications, and I just wanted to kind of comment on that. With the there are still guidelines in place. For those take homes, this isn't carte blanche take homes for people that still have uh, illicit drug use. Or could you just comment on that just a little bit more? Um, so say that. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Say that one one more time, Frank. This is the new take home regulations, oh, the flexibilities. This yeah. is not carte blanche it's just to give people medication. They still have to follow the guidelines for those take homes. And when you say the guidelines that that's laid out in the 42 CFR final rules. So, um, right. So I think the, uh, right. So, so the, um, the, the, the criteria that we laid out, um, kind of, you know, we did actually shorten them from eight to six, their six point criteria that, um, with the exception of the time and treatment, the other five are really considerations. Um, and so, and considerations that the, the practitioner needs to make kind of on a case by case, like an individualized basis. Um, and so each person's going to be different. And I think part of um, what in, uh, in some OTPs, kind of what we're hearing is, you know, the challenge is like, if you have, because um, people talk, right? So if you have um, patients and particularly like a married couple where, you know, one person is getting, you know, two weeks of take homes because that's kind of what uh, they and, um, you know, the, the OTP practitioner really have kind of worked towards. Um, and yet their spouse or their partner is uh, is not right. Then we have, you know, I mean, I've I think we've all had the experience where patients that have come in and said, well, wait a second, how come, you know, they're getting many more take homes than I am? Um, and I think that the responses back are really, um, you know, we're talking about you. Like, this is very, you know, don't worry about the, these other people. Kind of let's focus on you and um, and what uh, the, uh, the situation kind of looks like really uh, for you um, and with you. And then kind of work um, work from there. So um, I say that those are, there are considerations because I think um, in in applying them, the application of them, again, because if there's this risk-benefit analysis that goes into that decision-making, um, it may look different, uh, you know, kind of from one person to another. Okay, and thank you. And the last, I just want to reiterate, because you did touch on it, that state regulations may be more stringent than federal regulations. Yeah. I mean, I will say that, um, that we are... We've been, um, uh, you know, working with state opiate treatment authorities kind of across the country and um, that uh, the, um, 
We have about 18 states, I think now, that have indicated that they are fully aligning with um, with the, the federal regulations um, and, uh, and 35, I think, that are um, that have indicated that they're, they're planning on doing that. Um, you know, I think that the goal with these really is, again, to remove um, access barriers and um, and barriers to not only kind of initial access, but also then um, to retention and care, um, especially given, um, you know, the uh, the um, lethality of, kind of the, the existing drug supply. Um, and also then really, again, kind of working with people uh, because we know that this is a, a, a you know, a chronic health condition that has kind of its ups and downs and that sometimes can really take uh, quite some time for people to, to kind of engage in, um, in, in care, engage in, uh, in, um, in figuring out kind of, you know, how to make those positive changes, but that when people are making positive changes for themselves, even if they're really small, that that's something that, um, that we should uh, continue to work with them on. So, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, right. thank you Frank. Thank you, Dr. Olson. I know we just have about three minutes left. There's um, still a handful of questions here. I'll try to quickly tee a few up for you. Ken Stoller asks, says to clarify, <laughs> a patient who gets a split dose every day but gets half of their dose in clinic seven days a week, let's say a not yet stable pregnant person, are technically not getting a quote take home for each of these days when it comes to this time and treatment regulation. Otherwise, it would look like the patient got 30 take-homes that whole first month. He says, did I get this right? So um, if they're getting a, a take-home kind of, uh, <clears throat> if they're getting the second half of their take-home to take home, um, then uh, correct. It's because it's about the days of take-homes, not the doses. Okay. So hopefully uh, that was helpful. Um, this is a comment from John Beckman. It looks like more than a question. So I'm gonna keep moving and look for the ones that are questions. Um, will the slides be made available, Dr. Olson? We can talk to you about that offline, but if that's helpful, we'll put the recording and slides mm -hmm. on our website um, within the week. Um, Dr. Olson, do accreditation bodies know how to navigate judging all of their many standards in the setting of patients being permitted to opt out of camp counseling? So, um... Uh, so we are, we uh, have been since uh, April, we've been working with the uh, the six accreditation bodies, um, you know, to, to make sure that kind of their standards are also are aligning with the um, the federal regulations when it comes to kind of the OTPPs. Um, and, uh, and we will continue to work with them um, on that as well. So uh, yes, because I can understand that it, it, uh, it gets very confusing for OTPs if you're kind of trying to juggle between, um, you know, Two various di different sets of uh, of standards, and so um, uh, now I will say that I think one of the things that the with the accreditation bodies there are four sets that they have, you know, for OTPs, and then there are, there are other pieces kind of to their um, uh, to their standards as well um, that really are above and beyond kind of what uh, what we work with them on if that makes sense. Thank you. I recognize we are at 12 o'clock. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, if you'd like to answer another one or two, we can hang on or I could email them to you and then we could tee them back up or send them out because I know yeah. we're out of power. Yeah, yep. Now that, um, I think uh, the last one I would just say, so um, uh, mm -hmm. that Thelma says, are we supposed to give take home doses based on time and treatment or based on absence of, so, um, that <laughs> there are six points. So this is where that clinical judgment kind of piece comes in, right? So uh, it, you're supposed to give take-homes based on an individualized um, consideration of those six points and, and including the the one, the time and treatment that is kind of the fixed one. So um, so the answer is clinical judgment is really kind of where, um, where the, what this all comes down to. Um, and that that's, it seems scary for people because we've been so used to actually kind of doing it. Oh no, th this is kind of the rigid way, uh, you know, these are the, the rules and this is the rigid way to do this. And so we can talk more about kind of what is, what does that look like? What does it mean actually to, um, to be using clinical judgment? 
Thank you, Dr. Olson. There are a couple questions we couldn't um, get to. We are happy here at Max to help respond to those questions and a liaison with Dr. Olson for anything we weren't able to get to. The recording and the slides will be up within a week on our website. Thank you, Frank, so much for helping us pull this together. And Dr. Olson, you really, this time was invaluable. So Great. thanks, everybody. Thank you all. And happy to, um, to talk more uh, and come back. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very Have much. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.